It's oftentimes I go into bookstores and there are lines and lines and lines of bookshelves with um, uh, diets and cookbooks and uh, information in, about nutrition. And then I go to the fitness and the movement activity section and they're tiny. The former first lady looked at my books and she sent them to the President's Council on uh, Physical Fitness and Sports. And from that, the director chose me to be a President's Challenge Advocate. And it's a great website to send uh, parents to. It's called the President's Challenge org website. And one of the hardest things for children, of course, is consistency. They can chart their progress right there online. It's so easy. And they can also choose from many activities, pretty exciting ones. And it tends to make them try new activities. They also can win awards. So if they work out enough throughout the week, week after week after week consistently, and chart their progress online, they can win different medals and awards, which is very nice. So the First Lady right now is, is doing a lot of good in that regard, as, as we know, as well as with eating and nutrition. And so parents, teachers, caregivers, we're all on the front line to help our children get fit right now. We know that they're having a lot of problems in this regard. Those are some of the stats you can take a look at. Uh, First Lady was on a show last night, and she said that one in three children are having problems with obesity. And of course, the inactivity level is such that they're in front of some technological device uh, for seven hours a day. But what's funny is the children are the ones that teach the adults and role model oftentimes for them to get fit. Research has shown the clinical relevance of guided visual imagery to help children and adults cope with illness, injury, accidents, stress, etc. Visual imagery system provides a simple checklist, ABC checklist, to help the stress levels of all involved when a child has special health needs. They also contain flexibility, strength, and aerobic uh, components. So they are a full curriculum for activity for children. Today it's a bit like coming full circle talking with medical professionals here at Providence Sacred Heart Children's Hospital because I was a candy striper as a child and my father was a pediatrician and I did rounds with him when it was called Sacred Heart Hospital and my grandfather was chief of staff here, Dr. Edwin Judge Barnett and he also was a pediatrician and he was responsible for coming up with a cure for tick fever. My parents passed away at the age, they were both at the age of 40 and it was due to stress-related circumstances. As you can imagine, that was very traumatic for a child. And I didn't know that I had the habit, chronic, very bad, unhealthy habit of shallow chest breathing. Shallow chest breathing is something that most of us in the population have. It's debilitating, it's insidious, it um, can be subtle in nature, and it's something that when left unchecked can become ingrained and can be the root cause of illness and stress-related, uh, myriad of stress-related conditions. So shallow chest breathing, the barely perceptible, totally inadequate process of delivering air into our lungs while we go about our daily habits. And shallow chest breathing is something that when we don't get enough air in, we are breathing in the upper quadrant of our lungs primarily. And so old air, stale air, stays lodged at the base of our lungs. When we don't get enough air, all the cells that feed every other function of the body are deprived of life-giving vitality and oxygen. So we become the depleted servant of our breath instead of it helping us to thrive and function better. When I went to college, I discovered this insidious affliction. And so eventually I realized what my impediment was, and that was air. And every cell in my body was being robbed of that life-giving vitality. It sent me on a journey of discovery because I vowed to excel in dance as well as in the rest of my life where I was also restricted breathing-wise. And I studied the art of breathing as it relates to the functioning of the body, the movement aspect of the body. 
that has become my lifelong interest. I've been fortunate enough to work with Dr. Gregory Lowen here at Sacred Heart, and he's a pulmonary oncologist here, and now I work with his patients. And I'd like you to hear a little bit about what Dr. Lowen says about breathing. But one of the things that I am clear on is that it really matters how we think about our breathing. And I think the real key is it's possible to, especially if you have a lung condition, to sort of be controlled by your breathing. And the polar opposite of that is what Larkin tries to get people to do, which is to exert control over your own breathing. So I think that when you empower someone to take control of their breathing, uh, you can really change their physiology and how they function and, and what they're able to do. Um, Andrew Weil uh, talks a lot about the idea that we have two body systems, you might say, the autonomic nervous system, which takes care of the automatic pilot, you might say, for all kinds of body functions, the heartbeat and specifically the breathing. We've all have been sitting here breathing on our own without thinking about it for the last 20 minutes. But the respiratory system is unique because we also have voluntary control. And so by exercising that voluntary control through uh, breathing maneuvers like what uh, Larkin teaches, you can actually, I think, alter the nervous system. And, and that is really, I think, well shown even in scientific studies that we can improve uh, patient relaxation and, and how they feel by doing this kind of work. So hearing consistent feedback throughout the years as to how the breathing has helped children bring together a fitness program as well as adults, I know it's the breathing now. And since working with some of the pulmonary patients, there are some interesting results I'd like to share with you. This is a CT scan of uh, a patient, and they develop tracheal stenosis, which is a narrowing of the windpipe. And if you can see that little left, that little tiny left uh, area right there, in between the two lungs, they're lying on their back. So the lungs are the two larger spaces. So that's the windpipe. And at this point in time, it's the size of a small straw. It's about nine millimeters. And if you can see right here, right there, that's the esophagus. And it's actually larger in this case and at this point in time than the wind, windpipe. The patient is lying on their back. And it's like looking, the way he said to explain it to you, it's like a loaf of bread. And that's like one slice of the bread. Seven months later. There it is, it's 15 millimeters now in size. That's a six millimeter difference, life-giving, life life-changing. And the only thing that she had been doing for seven months, two forms of breathing that you're gonna be learning today and hopefully sharing with your, your children and your parents, and it also relates to their exercise program, that is three-dimensional balloon breathing, which is a deep diaphragmatic relaxation type of breathing as well as she was doing what I call a foundation formula breathing that involves your deep core abdominal muscles. So two different forms of breathing. Most of us say, I don't need to breathe. I've been doing it my whole life without giving it much thought. It just happens. But knowledge is power. We now know that breathing is the link to our state of mind. For example, fear shortens our breathing. When we are stressed, it becomes shallow and resides primarily in the upper chest, like I talked about. And breathing becomes erratic when we feel anxious, and it practically disappears when we concentrate. It's worth repeating, Dr. Lowen said that breathing is one of the only involuntary systems of the body that we can consciously control. Oxygen is our most immediate life-sustaining force. We take 16,000 to 23,000 breaths a day, yet we never stop to take one deep, conscious, purposeful breath, mindful breath, and we wonder why we're stressed and why our patients have pain and discomfort and get fidgety and bored and anxious and everything else. And it all starts with the breathing. Unconscious, spontaneous breathing, in fact, doesn't serve us. 
let's list some efficient breathing benefits. So why would we want to do it? It's so important to always know that first. Mental acuity, emotional equilibrium, physical stamina, which can translate into lifting heavy things, chores, daily movements, sports, exercise, and of course, physical therapy. It should, in my opinion, be ideally at the forefront of one's mind. In fact, whenever you're working in a physical therapy environment, it should be the priority, the constant priority. Breathing exercises also help our speaking voice and our singing voice. I've worked with a lot of opera singers and, and actresses and help them, Olympic athletes, Ironmen, ballet dancers, autistic children, children with special needs, uh, pre and post-op, it helps with, with so many universal extremes. Even at our desk, we can do it before we go in for an important meeting and it calms us down and centers us. On our way to and from work, it can help you get ready for your day. Breath work also helps to control stress, pain, muscle, cramps, fear, anxiety, depression, anger, as well as helps boost the immune system. The great body work traditions like yoga, tai chi, and meditation make breath the constant focus. In fact, they pass it down from one generation to the next. These centuries-old ancient disciplines emphasize the breath as it relates to the mind-body connection. Hippocrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, said that health is equal to our body-mind connection and the environment. In the last 30 years, I'm sure you're aware, researchers have become very interested in the mind-body connection. Dr. Langer and Ali Akrum are two Harvard researchers who said that health is significantly affected by mindset. Dr. Herbert Benson, in his Harvard research, said that body-mind techniques help with the healing process and coping with illness, injury, stress. Dr. Bernie Siegel, in his book, Love, Medicine, and Miracles, said the power to heal involves guided visual imagery. Dr. Andrew Weil says, Breathing is the master key to self-healing. The secret to our radiant health li lies literally right under our nose. But we as human beings forget it as we move through our lives. It's also, I think, because of our rest rushed technological society and we're so busy and we're so outwardly focused all the time that we don't have time to turn in. <laughs> we don't really have the tools to know how to turn into our body awareness. We climb stairs hoisting our body weight up against gravity's downward pull, which is like a moving squat, using the largest muscles in our body, and we get to the top and we apologize for being out of breath. Our breathing should be increased at that point, and we should allow it instead of holding back on it. We should embrace it. It's a visual imagery system that really helps us have a, a full fitness program. Visual imagery Simply put, visualization is something we see in our mind's eye. Imagery is something we feel with the rest of our body. Olympic athletes have used it for a long time to excel at their event. In fact, they visualize their upcoming event and they feel it kinesthetically as the, in their body. Let's say they're going down a hill in a ski event. They see themselves hitting every single curve perfectly, leaning at the exact right moment, defying gravity and the way they need to do it. Healthy people have a secret that our minds play an important role in our health. In fact, I don't think a fitness program without your mind-body connection working together really does you much good at all. So your mind has to be part of it. The logical solution to me, therefore, was to make a visual imagery system. And the formula is you've got these ABC exercises, alignment, breathing, core. Those are, to simplify it, your biomechanics, your building blocks, your essential principles of all movement. And then I combined it with visual imagery because when you have visual imagery, you have this quickest link to your mind-body connection. If you want to simplify it further, alignment exercises line up your bones so that your muscles are recruited in the proper sequence and you target the proper muscles. Breathing nourishes the muscles. And breathing, of course, is the fuel to contract your center or core muscles. Without it, it's like having a car without gasoline. So you have to have your breath to work your core. I'd like to share some of my simple strategies with you today. So you, can you see how easy it is to become an expert in fitness using these ABCs? 
Um, with children, what we do to find neutral pelvis is we picture the pelvic area as a fishbowl. And we ask them to dump the fish in the water forward, so you're in extension of the back in that case. Dump it backwards, and the poor little fish are falling out the back, or side to side, or even hula dancing. They feel what it's like to have all the fish in the water not sloshing around in the bowl. So what did we just do? We did shoulder blade arm fingertip. We did the compass exercise, and we did pelvis as a fishbowl. Isn't that all the bony landmarks of the body? It is. Heel sit bone connection, shoulder blade arm finger connection, and top of the head tailbone connection. You're done. There it is. So that's what I mean by having your bones in the right place to recruit the proper muscles. Now you have become an expert as to how to observe children and yourself move in terms of alignment. It's that simple. I'd like you to watch the dancers do the next form of breathing. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you do that. So that's step one, a clam clamping shut in the trunk. First layer of your abs. Second layer, external obliques, wrapping diagonally down. Internal obliques, in and up. Fourth layer of abs, wrap horizontally around the body and The fifth step sends all the abs to the wall behind you towards your spine. Let's watch them again. So we have five layers to our abdominal, well, four, but behind it are our hip flexors and multifidus, which is right in front of our sacrum. And they work as a unit to produce movement. But we break it apart in order to you to go from better breathing to optimal breathing and really strong core strength for life. So I'd like to try the first layer with you. So that was that clam clamping shut in the trunk or like a jaw closing. And the muscle fibers do run like that, and they wrap vertically together. Uh, for children, we call it a dragon mouth closing, so that they really, really pull those abs in. So let's talk about the breathing briefly. In this case, you will breathe without the straw through a giant hose like we did in the sit up and take notice exercise. And on a powerful exhale, like Dr. Lowen says, you'll breathe through pursed lips, pursed lip breathing, like breathing out through a trumpet. During the full duration of the exhalation, you will be contracting your abdominals deeper, 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 like a clam clamping shut. These are powerful, elastic bands that are very elusive, aren't they? Aren't our abs elusive? We have to have a picture of them to help us find them. And so you're going to be having them slide and glide across each other like this, like a docking system in your mind's eye, physically, mentally, like so. Okay? And we're going to do five in a row. The secret to this exercise is on your inhalations, do not let go of the abdominal contraction that you already have. Therefore, by the fifth one, can you imagine how deeply your abdominals will be contracted towards your spine? And why would we do that? because what lies behind it are your organs. So you replenish your organ health by doing this five-step foundation formula. You also heat up your core, and there's research now that says when you heat up your core on a regular basis, you have more white blood cells that go out and fight infection. And so therefore, it's a great immune booster. And it's at the basis of every single exercise that I teach children and adults, and I'm constantly queuing for it because I've seen people transform their lives, people who couldn't balance, autistic children who couldn't concentrate. They won't look you in your eyes. In fact, you'll only have their attention for 15 minutes, which is not true. I had their full attention and still do for an hour at a time pretty much because they make up their own images, but it's also the breathing and the centering. So they stay with you. They don't keep going and focusing on other things. When you make centering your priority constantly in any move that you do and you're cueing and helping the child, they 
concentrate much better. And in fact, what it does, it gives them a sense of security, grounding, confidence, vitality, and a heightened sense of being alive that in turn helps them be socially more um, comfortable in, in their own bodies. So their social skills, I've heard from their parents, have just gotten better and better and better due to just that one exercise. Take a deep breath into the back surfaces of your body, filling as much as you can. So here we go. Big inhale. More air. Relax through here so you can get more air in. More air. More. 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 Now exhale with power and tighten the abs like that clam. Tighter. Whooshing sound. Tighter. Wrap. Squeeze your glutes. Press your legs together. Ground your feet. Good. Now keep all of that tight. Don't let air in the front of your body. Picture it going into the back of the body. Inhale. Put your hands on your abs to help you not let air in the front. Keep them contracted tightly together. More air. Now exhale with power and contract. Visualize that clam clamping shut or a jaw clamping shut in the trunk. Tighter, tighter tighter, more, more abs, more abs, more abs, deeper abs. Keep them. Inhale into the back. Keep the muscles tight in the front as best you can. Put your hands on them. Don't let air in the front. Now exhale with power. Tighten in the front. More. Deepen. Deepen. It's sounding better. Sounding better. You guys are starting to be unafraid to make a whooshing sound. That is the key to your health. Again, inhale. More. Can you imagine how much air you have to get into the bottom of the pelvic floor? To fuel the contraction of the core, deepen. Deepen more. More. See it. Tighten more. The glutes are like, they have to be squeezed because it helps you get the abs in. One more. It's like having the bottom of a glass. Inhale. Now exhale with power. More. Breathe out with a sound. Don't be afraid. Do you believe how energizing that is? Heats you up, keeps you healthy. And it's something you can do at your desk, but then if you notice, the dancers took it to a piece of choreography where they use their arms to mimic that internal direction of the abdominal contraction and the image, which you can do too. Okay, so there's the second step, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. You tornado them backwards. There they are, one after the other, and I really recommend, yes, you can do one over and over and over again. It's, it's valuable, but if you do all five, you find the full potential of your core contraction, which protects you whenever you move through space, and it helps a child do fitness safely and effectively, always from the center of their body, instead of a limb orientation. And then there it is, like a stair step. It's worth memorizing and teaching it to your kids when they're feeling tired. We use what's called the elements of movement from Rudolf Laban, the most famous movement theorist to have ever lived. And the children are using these elements of time, space, force, effort, etc. And they are the same elements that are present in everything in life. So whether they decide to be a civil engineer, a scientist, an inventor, anything, these elements of movement are going to be in something that's ingrained in their body and in their library of information that they'll have. I'll try to paint a picture briefly. They'll be doing basic locomotor movements like gallop, skip, run, hop, jump twist, turn, those kind of movements. And then for a particular element of movement that day, for example, it would be, let's say, so we would say, let's do all of those things through ice, through mud, marshmallows, sleeping cats, a pit full of snakes. And so you get the idea. Their bodies completely transform doing that gallop. Suddenly that gallop takes on a whole different look to it because they're moving through those different environments and they're making it um, come alive. And 
we make it really, really easy because we put the words up on a board and they go look at the words and what's that, what's that. So they're learning and making the connections between the movement vocabulary and their physical vocabulary simultaneously. And it's so much fun to watch because they problem solve and there's no right and wrong and there's no test and there's no, this is the way it should be done. They get to choose, they get to make the choices. It's just phenomenal how that goes out and helps them in their academics where they do have to get a grade for everything. And it's fun to see how many different ways they can slide across the ice. And they come up with the decisions and you give them plenty of time to try it and plenty of opportunities to try it. Now more than ever, if you have your health, you are truly rich. And in fact, we need proactive, simple, practical programs like mine to help us stay fit and become more healthy. Visual imagery promotes an internal sense of well-being, relaxation, and addresses the hospital child's fears. They are so busy painting that picture of that image in their mind's eye that negative thoughts can't creep into their consciousness. In fact, they become centered just by repeating it over and over and over again. There was a doctor in Chicago, a psychologist, named Dr. Mulhaley, and he studied a bunch of athletes who use visualization. And he said, what happens when you work with visual imagery, the most direct link to your mind-body connection, is that time disappears. It goes by so fast. The kids are like, that was it? My adults I work with, it's over? Because he actually called it flow. It's a timeless, euphoric state that comes over you because you bring together the pieces of who you are as a human being. You drop your mind deep within your body, and you make huge changes because of it and I highly recommend you share them with your children and parents, is they might be temporarily weak, but they ta can tap into their spirited willpower and become part of their own recovery process and fitness process through the visual imagery. And you're going to notice they become very good at creating their own images. And when they're in the hospital and their freedoms are curtailed, the visual imagery helps them to be more in control. And arts in the hospital, I don't feel, are a luxury because they are the seed to problem solving and creative thinking. Both adults and children, because I work with people who are even you know, in wheelchairs, etc. but both of them learn that using visual imagery that their mind and their body are constantly interrelated and can help them get fit and healthier, especially when they have restrictions. And techniques help you, parents, and caregivers, teachers, tap into their vivid imaginations for a playful pathway to healing. But remember, these are anatomy-based, and they teach the child how their body works. So can you imagine how lucky and fortunate these kids are that starting out at this young age, they're going to learn how to breathe properly, how to line their body, how to use their core, and imagine what their level of fitness and quality of life is going to be compared to those who don't have this simple ABC program. Are there any questions? Yes? So I, I guess I'm a little curious about how long it takes if you're consciously trying to breathe correctly, how long it takes before it becomes unconscious? And the question is, when you're learning how to breathe more efficiently, become a better breathing machine, how long does it take for something that you have to think about to become unconscious? If Dr. Lowen was here, he would say, never. Because the whole purpose is, your breathing mechanism is one of the only involuntary functions of your body that you can consciously control. And so even when someone is meditating, the way to meditation for them is through their breath and focus upon it and then keep coming back to it. So the point is, is that there's no easy way around working on your breath and just, you know, yes, you do um, stretch out your intercostal muscles. You strengthen your four layers of abdominals. You strengthen your pelvic floor muscles, your gluteal muscles, your leg muscles. You um, get more elastic and, and, and ability to fill volumes of air into your lungs and out of your lungs. You stop using these smaller muscles to live from life. You get all those incredible changes in your life as well as helping all the dividends, the extra dividends for all the systems of your body. So you're getting all those benefits immediately, he said. But when you practice it over time and you make it something like brushing your teeth, a daily habit, you can cut down on those myriad of stress-related 
circumstances and conditions, keep fit illness at bay, but unfortunately, it doesn't become uh, second nature. I do have to say, though, with the images, it's something that helps you tap into it. I would say the feedback has been for the foundation formula that they start to feel the different layers, literally, the different layers in six weeks. And when I work with pulmonary patients who have one lung, who incrementally start out at an eight second inhale, and over time, I would say it usually again takes them about three to six weeks to go from an eight second inhale to a 20 to 25 second inhalation and exhalation without strain or holding. So in that sense, that's a great question because by practicing it, and they do practice it, they don't take, that's one part of the population that doesn't take breathing for granted is people who have these kind of lung issues. They get so much better at it. And what happens, be, going from eight seconds to 25 seconds, rosy complexion, um, their phlegm changes from uh, green or yellow to clear, not using their nebulizers for seven hours at a time, where for four years they've been using it seven times a day. The same thing for you know an Iron Man or a ballet dancer who has to have those reserves of power. Its changes are just phenomenal. But you really have to paint that vivid picture. You really have to get that razor sharp, sharp concentration. It is the glue that brings the mind and body together. So unfortunately, no, it never becomes something that is not purposeful and mindful. But in a way, what's so great about that is it relaxes your body while simultaneously quieting your mind. We need that. We are just, that little mind of ours is just going all day long, all day long, all day long, like a hamster on a hamster wheel. And the way to calm it down and get mental clarity is truly the gateway is the breath and the core, or the breath by itself and the balloon breathing. So it's really, really essential that you focus on it every day. And, and if, if you think you're going to forget, put breathe on your, on your computer or on your medicine chest. There's got to be a way where you stop taking it for granted and remember to breathe.